All right, welcome everyone. So we are back for another live session on a Tuesday and we have a really interesting guest today. When he comes, we're going to learn a little bit about the countryside, nature, hiking. It's kind of an interesting topic, I think, because I know a lot of people at the moment, they want to get out of the city. Sometimes maybe where it, maybe it's the same as where I live. There's lots of restrictions in the city at the moment. So you can't always go and do everything you used to do. So maybe getting out into the countryside is a great idea. So what better way to find out about that than to get somebody who really knows what he is talking about. Here he is, Hello. Jack Beeman right here. Jack, how are you? Not too bad, how are you doing, pal? Oh, wow, look, oh, you've got all the travel books behind you. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> You should become a YouTuber. You got like the perfect setup. I, I've got like this, oh. you know, pretty messy setup behind me. That's like, that's like professional it's almost, it's almost influencer. Like thought, it's almost like I thought about the background before I, uh, before we took the call. <laughs> oh, you, you, you didn't go to so much trouble for, no, for me, did you? <laughs> so how's life? Because um, you used to live in Paris. We, you mm. know, we used to work together in Paris. You've been back in the UK for a while. How's yes. life? You know what? Life, life's, uh, life's pretty good, mate. It's, uh, well, pretty good in the sense of as good as it can be. I think that's probably the better yep. way to put it. Um, obviously, living out here in the Lake District, it's a little bit different to being in the city. The major thing being, of course, there's, I've got a lot more freedom than what I think people realise compared to the city. Like, I know when the whole coronavirus thing was at its highest in Paris, you were confined to, was it one kilometre? If I remember correctly, yeah. Went, yeah, you know, really, really combined. Whereas the, where here in England, especially in the Lake District, where the countryside's a lot more open up and there's not as many people. I've we were going on big walks, going into the mountains and stuff, and not seeing anyone because obviously everyone was still inside. So having the ability and freedom to be able to do that was well fantastic, to put it politely. I mean, as though it's I don't, well, I, don't well, I don't want this to come across like. Um, it was great, and I, I'm, you know, I felt awful for the people who were stuck inside and stuff. And I can fully understand why people want to get out and explore now, get back into the countryside, and go and enjoy it again as well. Why don't you just explain to everybody where you live yeah. in the UK? Because it, it, it's probably the most beautiful part of the UK, I'd say so. Anyway, so just explain a little bit about the region where you're where you're from and where you're um, and where it is in the country. Yeah, so I'm based up right in the north of England. So basically, um, it's an area called the Lake District. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, right. And it's full of, some people call them mountains, some people call them hills. It's a very it's a very debatable thing. It's all about the height of them. But we have two, uh, hundreds and hundreds of different uh, hills that are across the area and lakes. And it's just a, it's just an area of natural beauty. There's no other way to describe it. It's, it's, there's famous, there's famous poems written about the area. There's lots of, it's used for loads of different films and it's just this stunning uh, rolling hill landscape and it's, um, yeah, it's just fantastic. And no, it's also known as the adventure capital of England as well. So there's lots of uh, canoeing, kayaking, uh, general adventuring, camping, hill walking, canyoning, mm -hmm. as well as obviously our background in cycling as well. Because of course, what we did. In well, it's really famous oh. for poetry. You know, this mm. is the country of Wordsworth uh, and Keats and people like this. Uh, yeah. Peter Rabbit was written up there exactly. as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Are there any films that people can watch and see some of the scenery of that region? Well, the one that comes straight to my mind, the biggest one was the Star Wars. I believe the the the, the newest, oldest one, so number seven. I think they used uh, they used a lot of the um, sort of the scenery for that. Um, Peter Rabbit, they do a lot of Peter Rabbit there. Right, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I've got off the top of my head. Um, a lot of TV shows, film, a lot of Brit English TV like um, sitcoms and. Uh, there's got to be some Midsummer Murders yeah. episodes filmed up there. I can't think of any of the big films now. That's quite annoying. Um, no, give, it, give me a minute. It'll come back to me. There's, there's been loads. There's been Jack, I think you might have your. I think you might have your finger on the microphone. Oh, so just be careful. Hello, can you hear me now? Is that better? Apologies. That's much the, better. The, yeah. You, in the countryside, the Wi-Fi is also quite bad. So that is. That's probably outside. technology as well. You're probably <laughs> not used to the technology. Yeah. Um. Okay. So before we get into the the real pro things of <laughs> you know kayaking and and all this kind of stuff. Mm. Um. Give me a bit of tips for people who maybe just want to do a little bit of hiking, but they see, I think the problem with some of these activities is you think, oh, it might be a good idea. And then you see all these people with like 
you know, thousands of pounds worth of equipment. Yeah. And then you say, oh, I, I, you know, I don't, I'm not at that level. Um, hiking. What would you recommend for people who just want to get into it? Just a little taste. Maybe they're not the fittest people in the world right now and they want to just do something that's not too strenuous. What, do, what, would, you re what would you recommend well, for that? The first thing is, is you don't need to go all out and buy the best pair of boots, you know, the, the world's best rucksack, the walking poles, the ice axes, because there's a funny saying in what we have over here. Well, it's all over the world, but it's all the, all the gear, no idea. And it's when people <laughs> go out and buy all the, all the stuff to go walk up the high streets in these little countryside towns. Now, yeah. all you need is a good, a good self drive, you know, saying willing to say, I am going to get to the top of this. It's no, because nobody walks halfway up a hill to turn back around again, unless there's a, a, a reason to, you know what I mean? You always aim for the top. Yeah. Good footwear. It's always a good thing. Never go up. Right. Not being, I, I should maybe have started with my background is obviously I, as well as working in, with Richard in Paris in bike tours. I don't know if he's mentioned that before. Um, is I work in the outdoor industry as an instructor. Uh, my family have an outdoor right. business and that kind of stuff. So we see it all the time when we take people out in these areas. Um, people going up in like flip flops or you know the I don't sandals. Um, Ugg uh, boots, you know these these shoes which are just not 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 the right shoes, and that's the worst thing to have. Worst thing to do because in in most cities you've got what's it police, ambulance, and fire brigade. We have the same thing here, but we have one more. We have mountain rescue, and mountain rescue right. it was in the title. And the amount of people, amount of times people get called out on the mountain rescue purely for bad footwear injuries is astonishing. So always have a decent pair of feet, a decent footwear on. Uh, always bring a first aid. Always bring, even if it's just okay. a, a, some plaster, some blister, some for, for in case you get a blister and a bit yeah. of, and a bandage. Just always be a little bit more prepared uh, because you never know what can happen. And always bring, always prepare for all weather as well. So even if it's a blistering hot day, 30 degrees, just bring a coat. Even if it's a lightweight one, stick it in the bottom of your bag because it can change like that in the mountains. Now, I read, I read somewhere that regarding keeping warm because the temperature can change and mm. things, it's actually about layers. Like it's mm. more layers are more important than that big coat that you might wear in the morning and then they take off. Yeah, so it, different layers is probably a good yeah. way to go, right? Yeah, exactly. So, like, a, I always when I when I whenever I'm in the hills, I always have a thermal top on, even if it's warm, just because it's it's just it's good to keep yourself at a good temperature, because you never know what's going to happen at the end of the day. You you might it might be just a normal day, really quiet, and then all of a sudden you might roll your ankle, and then you might take you what a walk could take one hour is now taking you five, and then you might start getting chilly because you're in shock. So it's just it's just always being prepared, always having the right number of layers on. Not just thinking, oh, it's a beautiful sunny day. I'll go out and my vest and my shorts, and I'll be fine. It's always, always think, think. It's never nice to say think of the worst outcome, but certainly just be prepared mm -hmm. to be prepared for the the worst sort of thing to happen. And then if it does, you're prepared for it. Hope for the best. And prepare for the, best, for the worst, exactly, exactly. as we say. And ninety nine percent okay. of the time that never happens as well. Normally, you have a fantastic day, get great pictures and great memories. I know one thing, I, I was down in the south of France over summer and did a little bit of hiking in the Pyrenees. Oh. Um, and, you know, I'm a pretty fit guy. I, yeah. I don't hike, I didn't hike very much, but I'm a pretty fit guy. And one thing I realized is take water, like yeah. more water than yeah. you think you will need that extra bottle. Take that extra bottle because it will come in handy. That, there's no better statement. That's probably the first thing I should have led with, to be honest with you, is water. Water is the necessity when it comes to walking. I've, had, I've, I've been quite lucky to walk in mountains ranges all over the world. One of the, worst experience, one of the worst decisions I ever made, though, was when I turned 18, me and my best friend Rory we were in South Africa, and we decided to go up Table Mountain in Cape Town when we were there on my 18th. And uh, we read that you could go up there for free if it was your birthday. So we turned up and we found out that that was only if you were South African. So we decided, ah, we'll walk it. It'll be fine. Forgetting that we're in South Africa in February in the middle of their summer. So mm -hmm. we're getting halfway up with only, I think between us, I wouldn't say we had more than two and a half, three litres between us. And we got halfway up and we realised like, we're in we're in a bit of a situation here where this could be quite dangerous so you're all luckily obviously i'm still here now so i'm fine and i was we got to the top eventually but it's one of those things where you always 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 bring 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 five liters and then bring an extra two in the bottom of your bag just in case as well just yeah. in case you need to help someone else out along the way one of the cool things about living in the lake district though is, and I've, I've discovered it quite a bit when i was uh, walking during lockdown well the isolation with the lockdown 
is um, mm -hmm. the amount of freshwater springs we have. It was fantastic okay. going along. And I, you'd finish all your water, because uh, I did a, I walked up a mountain called Bow Fell a few months ago, blister, in the middle of our blistering hot summer, ran out of water, and I just stumbled across this freshwater stream, uh, sorry, the freshwater spring, put my, I put my bottle into it, and I was getting this ice cold water, and something like that, it's like, uh, it's like liquid gold, you know what I mean, it was fantastic. It really is, yeah. it really is, because in the, in the Pyrenees, there, were, there was nothing like mm. that, um, and I was... Yeah, I was really feeling it after a while. So, oh, will. Yeah, it, yeah. Uh, definitely uh, take some extra water with you. That is a big one. But one thing I found is that before we were talking about how some people are maybe put off from hiking because they don't have all the equipment and things. But I think as well, maybe some people say, well, I don't really know how to use a map and a compass and kind of, I don't know where to go. But that's not that difficult now. There's so many resources online, is, is that right? Well, exactly, yeah. I mean, I, I've seen, um, there's, a, there's the app called the OS, the OS Map um, application, which you can get onto your phone, where you can... OS route, Map. The okay. OS Map sort of thing, where you can route plan. And you just basically, it's just like walking from eight, well, across Paris, walk across London, across whatever city you're in. It's, it, they've got, it, it's so high detailed now that you can follow it off your phone. And on, to, well, as, as well as, of course, being with the technology we have today, 4G and all these signals are getting better and better. But on top of that as well, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Lake District here, I'm not speaking globally. Mm -hmm. It's such a, such a popular area to visit. You're bound to meet somebody else who's doing the exact same walk as you. And you never know, you, you strike a conversation. In, uh, there's a thing about up, up in the north where a lot more friendlier, they say. Uh, so you start a conversation with someone and you end up talking with them and you end up maybe walking with them and you ask away. And on top of that, we've got lots of streets. Uh, we've got lots of signs up in the hills pointing for the summit. And on top of that, there's lots of charities which look after the hills as well. There's a famous one called Fix the Fells where they'll build, right. they'll build paths all the way up to the summit. And when I say paths, it's not like you're walking to free your, from, you know, to your local supermarket. It's still mm -hmm. a very natural looking path. It doesn't feel like you're walking on a a man-made route, if you will. But you should stick on the paths yeah, as absolutely well, right? Not. There's nothing yeah. you should never, unless you're with an expert, unless you're with someone, someone who says, right, I know the way, I'm, I'm takes the full control of the situation, you never abide to go off the path because that's when, we mentioned it before, the mountain rescue come out. And every year, working in the industry, working, you get a, um, an, the, the, instant, the annual report, I think they call it, off the mountain rescue and you just flip through the reports of the rescues are done and about 95 percent of them are people straying off the path so just make your route plan your route stick to your route that's one of the biggest things I, I would put out there it's interesting how you said that maybe people are a bit friendlier in the countryside and i think it's just when you put somebody in a city environment everybody's a bit reserved and a bit closed off yeah. in a city um not last weekend, but the weekend before, I went on a hike with um, with one of our friends, actually, with Phil. Oh. And we did, uh, yeah, we did like a 10, 15, uh, 15K kind of walk through the woods and through a couple of gardens and things. And, and I remember at one point, because he's American, we're both speaking English, and a French woman was near us, and she started talking to us. And, it, you know, it was nice. She was nice and open, and she was chatting for five minutes as we were kind of all walking in the same direction. And... I remember thinking she was the type of woman that if she was in the city, she would never talk to, you know, to kind of just randomly start a conversation with two people. So I really liked it that people are a bit more open yeah. in the countryside and, and more likely to help people. That, that was my biggest, when I moved to Paris, I moved to Paris oh, 2017. That was my first biggest shock about Paris was I've, I've lived in other cities around the world where, I wouldn't say it was like super, super friendly and you wouldn't just go up to a random person start a conversation. But, you know, you, if you said hello, you'd get a hello back. And in the Lake mm -hmm. District, it's almost rude. Well, in the countryside, I, keep, I should really say, it's almost rude not to say hello to someone as you walk past them or good morning, comment on the weather because it's always bad, apparently. You know, it's, yeah. just, it's, it's a very normal thing. Whereas if you did that in Paris, I mean, correct, I would be, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but I always found you almost get a bit of a dirty look as well. And it's, and it's just sort of, it's a sort of a dirty looking like a, what are you trying to get out of, out of me? So that was one of the biggest things for me being growing up in the countryside and just being used to being so friendly with strangers in the sense of always greet them, always say hello, just polite. Mm -hmm. And it's, that's, and that's a massive thing about when you're walking in the hills as well. If, whenever you walk past someone, you always say hello, having a nice walk. And it's, it's just the normal thing to do. And I, and I would say that's probably the same thing when you're in the Pyrenees as well. I'm sure 
Oh, you, really? You, you say you say hello. It's just it's just a it's just a very polite thing to do. It's almost it comes across rude, like I said. If you don't, I think so. I think so. But yeah, Paris is a great city, but mm. maybe that part, that one aspect, it needs to work on yeah, a little bit. It's funny because I run a lot, and every country I've lived in, and I've lived in a few. When you're running and somebody else is running, and then you pass that person. Mm especially if nobody else is around, you give them a quick wave or a quick nod or a quick like, hey, how you doing? That's the difference between me and you. When you're running, you pass people. <laughs> when I'm running, I get passed. <laughs> and, it, and it's funny because when I do it, I, I do it in Paris. And I still do it because I have faith in people. But I do it in Paris and people look at me like I'm you know, so strange for yeah. <laughs> trying to say hello to somebody I don't know. Yeah. I did want to talk about camping as yeah. well because... Yeah. Especially this year, I think a lot of people are staying in their own country to go on holiday. Um, probably next year as well, let's face it. it this this okay. thing's not great. disappearing anytime quickly. Um, and also, camping doesn't have to be expensive. No. Right? Cool. Just like we talked about with hiking, you don't need all the equipment, dude. No. I mean, I've, how long ago would it have been? About, I was camping about two months ago, I'd say it was the last time I did a proper, proper camp. It was with me and my girlfriend. We went up to uh, a place called Stickle Tarn. There's a lot of, a tarn, a, I should really explain, a tarn is like a small mountain lake in the middle of like okay. half a hill and stuff. And then we do this thing called wild camping. In Scotland, it's it's an it's a it's a legal sorry it's a legal thing to do where you can camp anywhere you kind of want. Uh, in England and Wales, it's a lot more illegal shall we say to the point where as long as you would never go to, to a random person's field and start camping however as long as you're out the way and you're out of uh well maybe to say harm's way of everyone uh that's what you can do and it's no charge as long as you're above a set height uh and you clean up after yourself you can go camping up there so that's already cutting your cost there because you're not paying the camping fee because believe it or mm -hmm. not it can be quite expensive to pitch a tent in someone's field <laughs> if they do charge quite a bit because obviously there's all the facilities alongside it so when it comes, that's the one kind of thing you do have to take a hit for, shall we say, with, with wild camping, is the facilities. There are none. Your, your, your toilets are whole and all this kind of stuff. But that's why camping, wild camping in the lake district is great because there's so many times you've got these times where we go swimming in and washing in and wash your dishes and all that kind of stuff in. Uh, and as for the camping gear, I mean, yeah, we've got, again, luckily being in the lake district, our key demographic, our key kind of, sorry, um, stereotypical shop shall we say is a mountaineering shop we have hundreds of them. Mm -hmm. my hometown keswick the high street i think i believe is 80 percent mountaineering shops now right and there's so many good withstandable tents you can buy for less than 20 quid which would last you a good couple of nights you know what i mean because the whole point of wild camping is it's not a two-week vacation camping by a lake it's it's only a night or two then maybe you'd move mm -hmm. on doing a night or two somewhere else and along with that you need to got a mountain so you get a decent temp but you can also buy the packet ration meals where you just put a bit of water in and you can get a hell of a lot of protein a hell of a lot of calories but what you need to withstand a cold night sometimes because it's not always the mm -hmm. guarantee of a fire of finding the right wood of getting everything so it's 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 what we talked about earlier on it's it's just being living basically but being prepared as well just having all the basic uh, base necessities you need to kind of get by when you're camping, you don't need to bring, you know, your your four, your iPad 2 and your laptop at the end of the day because the whole point of the camping experience here is just to enjoy being, if I want for a better word, kind of as at one with nature. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, uh, Right, well, I, yeah. one, thing, one thing I really am concerned about is just how much technology is in oh, our lives yeah. nowadays. And there's this just way too much. And it must be great going camping because you just get mm. away from all that. Oh, right? absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's just great just switching. I, I mean, I personally, I switch my phone off. I, I, we do, you always take a phone. That's the first thing you should say. One of the first things you pack is always a phone as well because you never know what can happen. But I always switch, try and switch my phone off or at least put it onto flight mode for a good few hours just so I can kind of escape it all. And the beautiful thing as well is normally you're away from all natural light. And if you get a good night, it's all starry. And if you've got enough wood around the campfire, you, you, you forget everything. You forget about everything. And one of the best things to happen when we went wild camping with, uh, with uh, Katie, my girlfriend, was we, we, we forgot about everything which was going on in the world, which was great. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We forgot about the coronavirus. We forgot about everything just because it's just so relaxing. Just being on your own in the middle of nowhere, just... It's just something about it. I certainly 
Uh, yeah, there's there's nothing really I can think to match it as long as the as long as it's not pouring down with rain, which can always put a bit of a dampener on. But it, mm -hmm. it is fantastic, and it's just a great way to experience life. I think. Now, one of the one of the reasons I wanted to get you on, Jack, is because you're a pretty young guy, but you've done some really awesome experiences, and you've been to some great places. You've done some great things as well. Uh, I can see all those books behind yeah. you, all the Lo Lonely Planet books and things like this. Tell us about one of your favorite. Actually, no, there's one I do want to talk to you about because yeah. you hitchhiked mm. to Romania. Yeah, that's right? right. Yeah, yeah. So, wow, okay. tell us about this. Excuse me. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, yeah, so me and my, uh, me and my good friend Ben, we have a, another friend who lives in Romania or in Bucharest who runs a hostel. And um, our friend who lives out in Romania, he was renowned for traveling around the world but via hitchhiking. He's done it in loads of different ways. So he, he hitchhiked across the whole of North America only using Tinder. Like, you know, he would match someone and ask them to ask them to if they could give him a lift to the next spot and all this kind of stuff. Bit of a wacky guy, but really, really cool. And he invited me and Ben out to this his hostel's anniversary to do a bit of a speech and all this kind of stuff. And we said, yeah, and we'll travel there in the way which you would have done it. So we said, ah, oh, we'll try hitchhiking. <laughs> so we set off from Paris and um, we met all, every, every, all sorts of life. You know what I mean? It was one of those experiences where if you had a if you had a list of every single kind of characteristic of a person in the world, I met we met them. It was, but it was all it was all a positive experience. Oh, so it wasn't just truck drivers. No, no, God, no, no, absolutely not. We got we got. I think we we would have had used we used over about twenty five, twenty six drivers. And I say I definitely had one truck driver. We got in one truck. Take it that way. One like uh -huh. HGV lorry. The rest were yeah, all yeah. kind people who picked us up, and we went from take this way when we were in paris the first car that picked us up we were expecting to be in this petrol station on the outskirts of paris for hours 10 minutes an ex-professional turkish footballer picked us up in a that year's mercedes benz so <laughs> it, it took us all the way to frankfurt as well so it's just one of those things where you've got to you've got to i would first, I would, first of all if you want advice about it never do it alone i would fully recommend i wouldn't have done it right. alone. even i'm six foot four and all this kind of stuff and i'm friendly but right not... because i was going to ask you like a, yeah. you know you're a big guy i mm. tall kind of well you know big big broad shoulders and stuff like this mm. like you know maybe a little bit of big beard you know a big viking basically <laughs> so you know maybe a bit intimidating for some people yeah I, well i i personally thought that too but i think if you've got the right personality in quite a, a friendly manner then uh -huh. it comes across. Then it, it just instantly comes across. Like my, uh, my my grandma always calls me the BFG, a big friendly ginger, and I've just kind of always <laughs> adapted that kind of you know yeah, yeah. characteristic towards it. But going kind of linking it to what we were talking about earlier on with the camping, we um, we had a few experiences in this hitchhiking trip where camping was involved. Some good, some <laughs> maybe not so good. I'd say one of the worst nights I've ever had, and I'm going to do this camping was mm -hmm. on this um was on this hitchhiking trip because we got to frankfurt that that story i told you and frankfurt wasn't our planned destination so we were a bit like we're a bit we're, we weren't too sure what to do so we got there anyways we couldn't get a lift out of frankfurt so we thought oh we'll find somewhere to stay for the night couldn't find anywhere to stay hostels hotels there was not a single thing available and we we wanted to carry as little as possible because we didn't know how long it was going to take us and all this so we bought mm -hmm. these like quite well high-end military style um hammocks and we're thinking okay. oh, we'll just hammock it couldn't find anywhere to hang this hammock and eventually we thought ah airport we'll sleep in the airport couldn't get in the berlin Air uh, sorry into frankfurt airport so that we ended up sleeping the night and if anyone here has been to frankfurt airport will know there's a humongous uh roundabout outside it with loads of trees and stuff in the middle and we spent our first night hitchhiking sleeping in the middle of this roundabout and when you're doing that you kind of click to think, why on earth am I spending my? Let's face, let's face it. It was a, it was a holiday from work. At the end of the day, I wasn't going to get loads of it. Why on earth am I doing this? But then you kind of it, it made me appreciate even just the basic camping which I've done for like the one night where I've got a, a, a fairly rubbish tent, you know, and it's raining and all this kind of stuff. I would have taken that a hundred times again over sleeping in the Frankfurt Airport roundabout with airplanes flying over my head, getting about an hour's kit. But then you look at the opposite stretch, and we were lucky enough to land in Munich. We got a ride from down to Munich eventually. And we landed there the day Oktoberfest arrived. Everyone should know Oktoberfest. It's famous. Beer Great. And uh, yet again, no plans. So we were like, well, we can't find anywhere to stay. But we luckily found a, a festival which provided um, 
uh, a tent, a bed, and most importantly, unlimited beer for uh, wow, great. 100, 100 euros. I think it was no, sorry, 90 euros a night. So we were like, well, okay. it's expensive, but why not? It'd be a good look. And it was one of the most fun. It was called Stock Travel. It was one that, well, I'm sure you just had to really oh, ensure so, that you so drank good. your money's worth. Exactly, right? you had to drink our money's worth. We soaked in the German culture, from what I remember, and it was, it was, but it was fantastic. You know what I mean? Like very, and it, it was funny as well because that fit, we went from obviously the Frankfurt experience to that, and just having the basic facilities of a shower and being able to brush my teeth and be able to wash my mouth and stuff after doing that, and all, uh -huh. it, it was like it was like I found a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow. Do you know what I mean? It was incredible. It was just having the base. So you had um you had an ex Turkish footballer in a great yeah. Mercedes who took you. You said about twenty five, twenty six people yeah. gave you rides. What other kind of profiles did did you meet? So we had a. So I remember. I remember we had a French Hungarian man who was the third richest man in Budapest, and that wasn't like him saying it. We've actually we found out he owned this massive building company, which was really interesting. Uh, but then we had the opposite veteran. We had a, we had a chap who, um, who, who took us on, it was when we were in Romania. It was one of the final stints. I, I can't remember where, what part of Romania. There was some very long named places, but he drove us via his mum, his mums or his mothers and took us for a dinner there. And had like a traditional Romanian dinner and seeing how they kind of lived. It was very, you know, it was everyone in one room. It was one pot meal. It was just mm -hmm. the most basic living, but yet, he even he was willing to you know provi provide that meal for us and we tried to give him money and he wasn't having it and tried to I give think him money sometimes for people forget and... that when they mm. when they go away like don't be scared of asking you know <laughs> starting conversations with people or even yeah. especially if you want to English learners if you want to practice your English you go to somewhere like the Lake District start a conversation with someone like Jack he'll talk to oh. you for hours because people are generally quite proud of their area or their country and they just want to show you how how great it is so and what, yeah what that's I a really good good way to meet other people and what I found as well which was incredible was I don't speak I mean you, you've known me for a few years Richard I, I don't speak great I speak enough a little bit of French but I don't speak great French I don't right. speak German I don't speak Hungarian I don't speak Austrian I don't speak I don't speak any of many other languages yet I learned so much about all these people's lives who I did this hitchhiking trip with. I can still remember mm -hmm. the guy who took us uh, uh, from uh, from just outside of Frankfurt down to Munich. His name was Jelko. He was from Greece. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he moved over to Munich 30 years ago to get a better life with his family. He didn't speak a word of English, mind. He was doing it, well, he spoke very basic English. And this was all done through, you know, the Google Translate app, through just kind of picking up a few German words, which I knew and trying mm -hmm. to string forward conversations. He spoke a little bit of French. So it was, it was just incredible to, uh, I mean, this, this trip was three years ago and I still remember that. And it's just, it, the, even though, you like, even though you've, you maybe don't share the first, your first, like your mother tongue with this person, you still learn so much about them, which I found fascinating. But just mm -hmm. before I forget to mention as well, it's funny you said, go to the Lake District and speak English. Something your, your students might not know is, Obviously, in England or in the UK, there's a lot of uh, accent. You know, you're, you're from Manchester, so you've got a bit of a Mancunian accent. I'm, you know, I'm, I can't believe, actually, I can't believe I'm missing Man United Paris Saint-Germain to speak this. to a Man City fan right now. No, that's, I mean, that's commitment, everybody is, who's watching. It is commitment, but then again, I wouldn't really commit to watching Man United lose against I mean, it's funny because we've got, you know, the accent and stuff, but in Cumbria, we have an old kind of, it's a bit like a Gaelic language. It's not spoken at all. It's not, you know, it's not like we, you go down the street and hear people speaking Cumbrian, we call it, but mm -hmm. it's like an old farming language. So, for example, and people say I'm lying. Oh, they say words like pagger and stuff, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. And like one to ten in Cumbrian is Yan, Tan, Tevera, Mevera, Pip, Severa, Devera, Divera, Dovera, Dick. Like, right. you know what I mean? So it's, it's funny how, it's funny how, um, how even though, even though English is obviously our first language and it always will be, uh -huh. we've still got these kind of old languages, which people are still, you know, clinging on to. Like I can go into the pub and I can go, you know, matter how's it, Jan? What's Fettel like? Yeah. And they'll know what I'm saying. Fettel, it, yeah. You know what I mean? They'll know what I'm saying. Even though it's English, uh -huh. <laughs> people from London wouldn't have, a clue what i've just said or people from you know it's just i find that quite well that's what that's actually interesting because i always tell my learners look 
the goal is not to understand 100% of the words. And you can tell this, Jack, because you lived in France. Mm. Your French was not perfect at all. No. It's about understanding maybe even as little as 30% of a sentence. Yeah. And then you can kind of work it out in your head by the context of it and, you know, mm. and the situation. So something like that, where you go to a place that maybe people aren't speaking that standard English you'd learn in a textbook. Well, you're not going to understand every word. I don't, I wouldn't understand every word if I went to Cumbria uh, and I lived in Cumbria for a, a couple of years. So, you didn't, yeah. so yeah, it's a good practice sometimes I think. And I guess you've experienced this in France, right? No, oh, absolutely. I like, I, I remember if you, like if I went to a baker or a supermarket, I, I wouldn't be able to get the full sentence up. But if as soon as I got a word or sorry, let me rephrase it. I wouldn't understand the full sentence they were saying to me, but as soon as they said a word, which I knew, it was all it was never the it was never like the word the or and it was like fish or broken or something like that do you know what i mean it was a word which yeah, I, yeah. Could, I could work out what they were saying so as long as you can pick up the one the one kind of word in the sentence it works straight away so especially let's say for example going back to what the topic is about being in the hills and stuff let's say if you're lost just learn pick up the basic skills of emergency kind of emergency language in the mountains like i'm lost can you help or this kind of stuff water uh, water you know what i mean this these kind of these kind of words and you'll be fine because we're we're friendly fo well most of us are very friendly folk and we're always going to be willing to help as well so no i think people are always uh, always willing to help other people in a situation like that because they know that things can go wrong and things can go wrong quickly. But that's why we said you should definitely stay on the trails. Yeah. Find the route before you go. Absolutely. There's so many websites now. When I go hiking, I download the route and then I can put it on my phone. It's pre-programmed and I just follow the GPS. And, and so try and do that. Mm -hmm. Clean up after yourself. Don't litter the countryside and just be respectful to the area yeah absolutely. i think that's um but it's funny you mentioned that that's one of the biggest issues we had during the uh the lockdown period was littering we had a lot of oh, people wow. who were coming up to the lake district camping overnight in the hills you know going which is you know it's fine you nothing mm -hmm. there's no there's no we're not it's not the fact that you that people are going to do that but they, they'd go up and they would leave they treat it like a festival you know they would have a campfire have hundreds of beers and that kind of stuff but then they would leave and they wouldn't some of the people would even take their tents you know, some people wouldn't even take, they would, they would have it, they leave it all behind. And the thing is, I think people believe that there's people pay, like like local binmen, shall I say, to come clear that up. Mm. What people don't realise is it's it's pure volunteers. The Lake District National Park is run 95% by volunteers. So if you, if you don't pick up a dog poo and you leave your dog poo bag on the side, or if you have a can of beer and chuck it over there, the person who's picking it up is the person who's not getting paid to do so. So... Yeah we were having issues where um, there was like monthly meetups where it was like a social distance lake walk where mm -hmm. couples and people come up and pick all the rubbish and they, they would have, I'm not kidding, like trucks and trucks or bags full of rubbish. So there is obviously the downside of that as well. And it's, Making sure well, maybe um, maybe as topic for another uh, live we might do in a couple of months, but mm -hmm. this is a huge problem uh, at Everest, right? Like, oh. Mount Everest has a huge problem with trash. Yeah, you know, litter, trash. It's not a very nice thing to say, but obviously bodies as well. It, 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 yeah, it, yeah. And I've, there's a, someone, someone we know in our family who, who, who's gone up Everest before. Right. An old family friend. And they were saying how it's... Um, it's like oh, you just walk past, you walk yeah, past you just dead walk bodies, past basically. Stuff. But more to the point is that you're now queuing to get to the top of Everest. Like, yeah. it, that, and that... that it shouldn't happen in a day. It shouldn't be. Literally. Let's uh, let's say let's save that because yeah. I'd love to get yeah. you back on in about a month or six Absolutely. weeks and talk about that because that's a cool one. Um, just before we go, I know it's difficult for travel at the moment, but do you have a, you know doing some hiking or some camping? Do you have like a dream destination? I know some people they want to go to the you know the Rockies in North America or they want to go to mm -hmm. Nepal or you know Bhutan and kind of go and hike in the Himalayas. Have you got any? area you'd your dream destination to go hiking or to go out into the countryside i mean i, I mean there's hundreds the, the two i've got two which jump out to me straight away and it's uh either doing the machu picchu kind of the inca trail range yeah um, my my godmother did it back in the um back in the 80s and show me show me some pictures of it and it just looks incredible it's just something which i would love mm -hmm. to you know have a pop at or going into you know Yellowstone, seeing El Capitan, walking around that sort of area. I've always, 
always wanted to go around Colorado and explore that kind of that kind of region of America and hit hit the hit that side of it. So those two are probably hiking wise where I'd like to go and explore a lot more. Great, perfect. Well, we're going to get you back on the show, Jack, in a couple of months because uh, you've got some great stories. And yeah, I want to talk about Everest. It's one of my favorite subjects oh, because I it's, I've, I've read a couple of books about it, mm. and uh, yeah, it's a really interesting but, thing I've that's got, going I'm on. I'm reading the book up there. It's that one there. It's about Everest. Which one? What's it called? <laughs> oh, shit. Ronald Fines. Gold. All right, okay. Yep. Yeah. And it's been mentioned about how he went up there. It's fantastic. I would fully recommend you read that one. Well, yeah, because, um, yeah, we might, we might, I'd love to talk about Everest because maybe it, maybe it's a lesson for life that people, like we were talking about with hiking or camping, start at the bottom, start simple and gradually build it up, Absolutely, right? Yeah. But this is a problem with Everest. You get rich people, they've never climbed a mountain before and oh. they go, oh, I want to do Everest first time. So, uh, and yeah. They think, we'll and they think it's just a mountain. That's the thing, but it's more than just a mountain. It's a, it's a, well, it's mother nature herself it's the boss isn't it it's the it's the last the level. ultimate challenge yeah i mean it's the ultimate challenge but yeah let's leave it for another chat because i could i could talk about everest for days mate so <laughs> all right great jack thanks so much for coming on the show really interesting really interesting topic that uh people are going to learn a bit from it and get some great english practice as well this is why i wanted to do it not just to get other people from different countries speaking <laughs> english but just a regular guy from england speaking british english as well so it's good practice for everybody listening so thanks very much for that and uh we'll get you back in a couple of months no, thank you very much for having me and if any of your listeners and students want to fire any questions my my instagram well i'll put i'll put your uh, i'll put your name in the link and yeah, uh yeah far. check it. everybody follow jack he's always putting great photos it's all inspiration for getting out there into the countryside so uh yeah, yeah. if you've got any questions fire them to him thank okay. you for having me all the best mate Stay cheers safe. mate bye. thanks bye